Hello, I'm Sarah. This is Hardcover Hearts. Welcome to 2022. This is my week of reading where I talk about the books that I read, what I'm currently reading, and then potentially what I could read next week based on my mood. Uh, if you're new here, welcome. Uh, and if you have come back, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a bunch of books to talk about this week. Not as many as I had hoped. I had kind of pulled some of the best uh, from a whole bunch of lists that I wanted to finish out the year. Didn't get as far as I wanted and have made peace with that. <laughs> I mean, you know, what can you do? I, there's only so many, hour, so many hours of the day, other things need to be done. And uh, I had overly lofty, way overly lofty goals, even for my pace that I read at, which is pretty fast. So let's get into what I did finish because I read some great things. Uh, the first one, uh, this I saw on Bookish Twitter. This is The Feast by Margaret Kennedy. Just a really gorgeous cover. This is from Faber. I got it in the UK. I'll put a link to my Blackwell's affiliate link below. That's where I purchased this and it was so worth it. This, uh, this is a magnificent, fantastic romp of a book. Um, how to talk about this. So this involves one of my favorite kind of tropes uh, or formulas, which is where you are told what is going to happen in the book at the beginning. And then the rest of the book is just kind of seeing everything, these disparate pieces coming together to, a, to the conclusion that you know is going to happen. Uh, and it, it was delightful. The, the setup, the actual story is about this family, the Siddles, who are, have opened up their home, their manor home, into kind of a makeshift hotel. And they've done that because they are really struggling financially. Uh, and this home sits, it's this beautiful home and it sits on this cliffside. It opens because one of the local parish uh, ministers, er, reverends, priests, what do they call them in, in the UK? Uh, he has to do a this very strange kind of group funeral because the entire thing has fallen into the into the ocean. You like, wait, does, has and they don't know who who has survived and who hasn't. And so it's you know wild, wild premise. So there's this immediately this moment of like anticipation, like, oh, you know that that the people may or may not survive, uh, which was delicious and, and, and wonderful. And this is filled with horrible, horrible characters, <laughs> really bad characters. Uh, there's multiple families uh, that are staying here. Uh, there are gossips and and mean people and uh, lazy people and uh, gluttonous people. I mean, there's, there's just every single kind of, of ill that can exist are staying at this place at the same time of, of all ages. So we have children up to very old adults. Uh, and it, the setup was great. The ending was so satisfying, so satisfying, even though you knew what was coming. Like I knew what was gonna happen and yet I was still so happy and uh, really loved how how it ended. Uh, incredibly well written. Faber reissued this. Uh, this was originally written in 1950 and it's set in Cornwall in 47. Uh, so what everyone is saying is is absolutely correct. This was magnificent. Uh, I'll, as I mentioned, I have a link to my Blackwell's affiliate link. Uh, should you want to order it from the UK, and I will say the prices from the UK are incredibly reasonable. Uh, so give that a look. Then next up, I think I've made mention that I did some reading in advance of this. You know, the, the work, the homework to, to read into a book uh, sometimes excites me, sometimes it's really stressful. Uh, and this time, this time it was really good. I had the digital arc from NetGalley for this book. This is the latest from Colin Tobin's uh, kind of works. He does these, he's been doing these fictional biographies of literary greats and also literary greats who um, 
are closeted homosexuals. And, and really interesting, it's, it's this niche that he's developing I'm finding quite interesting. Uh, so he did, before he did this book, uh, this is about Henry James, this is The Master. Just gorgeous, gorgeous cover. And I think this didn't work as much for me as I wanted it to because I didn't know a lot about Henry James. And so therefore, I, I didn't have the context to really see wh what he was adding or what he was choosing to discuss or where he was spending his emphasis and his time. Uh, whereas uh, I did have a much better experience reading The Magician. Uh, and this is his latest uh, that it is out on and, and published now. And this is about Thomas Mann. Uh, if you remember, I read Buddenbrooks just recently to kind of prepare myself for this. So not only did I read The Master, I also read Buddenbrooks. I had already read uh, Death in Venice many, many years ago. So I had that familiarity. I think what makes this book much better than The, the Master is that Thomas Mann is just really interesting. Uh, he, he, and his family is even more interesting. He comes from a merchant family, upper middle class merchant family in Germany, and it all has always wanted to write. Uh, and his brother is also a writer. So there's a little bit of antagonism with him and his brother and his father, who really wanted uh, the sons to kind of take up his his trade. Uh, then we move into kind of him meeting his wife wife and them having six children and these this, so this part of the family his his family that he has he he has with his wife are fascinating uh, half of them are gay or queer uh, bisexual uh, and the others are equally wild very outspoken uh, brash uh, and I so, and so it's not only the the family and that milieu, but also the time. So here is a man who was kind of seen as one of the preeminent writers in Germany at the time between the wars. So after, so he had written a few of the books uh, after World War One, and then had was really pulled in and asked to atone for, address, discuss uh, Nazism and the rise of fascism in Germany. And he, he, you get to see his, his conflicts uh, and th the questions that he has of, you know, how far does he want to denounce? What is that going to do for the people that he knows that are still in Germany? He has fled and is in exile uh, with his family. Uh, what is it going to do to his sales? Uh, you know, what would it do to the, his publishers and the people that he cares about that he works with? Uh, so he is more reserved. His family is more virulently anti-Nazi and all of the machinations that bring him into being a spokesperson uh, for Germany and being able to represent uh, and try to hold Germans to a, a higher standard than what was happening during the World War II. Uh, he moves to the United States and there's all sorts of, of interesting pieces there with the government and way he, ways he interacted with the government and the press. Uh, so overall, that all is very, very interesting. And then we have his uh, homosexuality and, and what he does and what he doesn't do and how he holds himself back. I mean, he had six children with his wife. And so we get a little bit and a little taste of, of all of that. So, I, and then it's done with Colm Tobin's deafness. You know, he's a very subtle writer. He can craft great sentences. He can create a milieu. He's a good writer, but he's a very, it's very slow. It's very ponderous. It's very thoughtful. And I think the, the mix here that worked for me is the material, uh, kind of this, this wild material plus his, his style really f was able to kind of meld together and provide a really great book. So I thought it was very, very good. And I'm so glad that I read Bodenbrook's in advance of it uh, because I felt like I had a little bit more insight and information. And even a Wikipedia uh, review of him even helps to kind of give you some context going into that. So keep that in mind if that's something that you would like to read.
Then I did get a chance to finish this book with Elizabeth of Bookish North. This is The Waves by Virginia Woolf. So we've been doing this Virginia Woolf project. We have one more to go in our reading of, the, of her fiction. Now, I'm so, so glad that we read everything in order because you can see the building blocks. You can see her trying things, trying new things, and then where she's able to make alterations or changes or, um, or, or expound upon these techniques and styles that she's known for. The, the most obvious example is stream of consciousness, which she developed and really puts in expert use here. So this is broken into, I think, nine different sections. And you have uh, these monologues of, from these different characters uh, told, and you only know who it is because it says so-and-so said. Uh, there's six different characters, uh, three men and three women, and we grow up with them from the time when they are young infants playing and they're all, they all go to school together through to late in, in their lives. And then in, in between these, uh, these kind of, as markers or um, passages of time are these really beautiful, poetic, uh, quieting, thoughtful nature writing about the, uh, about where the sun is in the sky and what that's doing in the light and, and the way nature responds to that light or the absence of it. And it really helped to give you a breather between all of this intenseness with these, with these characters. So we have the, we have the sun going across the sky in these, in these interludes and that really gives us a, a kind of a time marker. And then we move into the uh, uh, conversations or the monologues of these characters. And at that point, we've jumped in time into a new, per a new period of, of their lives, you know, so childhood into going away to school, into, you know, college, into on their own, uh, you know, th those types of leaps forward in someone's life. Then we also have the waves. And so with the waves is the cyclical, uh, you know, the, the, the things that happen over and over and over again, and they're going to continue to happen. So it feels like it's uh, repetition and never ending and, and things that are going over and over and over again. And it made me think about Brene Brown. She is kind of the psychi psychologist uh, that writes about uh, society and the way people think. And she talks about the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves. And she says that a lot of times we need to break those stories because they become deeply embedded into uh, who we think we are and how we think the world perceives us. And we get that in these, in these characters. Now, Virginia Woolf does an expert an expert job at differentiating these characters. Y you know, at the very beginning, it's very confusing because they're children, but it's highly stylized writing, very highly stylized. Uh, I mentioned last week that it feels like prose uh, play almost uh, because we have one person stepping into the frame and, we're, and we follow that person's thinking. Uh, and then it and then all of a sudden it'll someone else will switch out, uh, and so be, because they're young and they're children, uh, they have very it, it's all kind of scattered. It's very fast. Uh, we go from one to another to another to another. You know, like children babble around each other and uh, interrupt each other and. And it just seems a little chaotic. And then as you go further in the book, we have longer passages from the different characters to eventually we settle on one character and get their point of view. Uh, there's, she's, as I mentioned, she becomes really adept at, at helping you know very, very quickly who is 
who we're, we're embodying at that moment, who, who's talking. And they talk about themselves and their fears and what they're thinking, but they also talk about the other people. So we get a sense of how this friend group is progressing. There's also a character, Percival, who sits outside. He's a f member of their friend group, but uh, something happens to him and it shapes all of them in different ways. And so much of this I found that I found interesting was about how this is the same generation. This is a group that grew up together. So we should be think they should have more in common or thinking more similarly than we would expect an, any other group of six individuals to act, think, feel. But she's she recognizes the individual uh, is is influenced and shaped by their stories that they tell themselves, the things that have happened to them, and, as well as their, car their class, their race, their ethnicity, their, uh, you know, their, their nationality, all of those things. And so she does this deft, uh, uh, has this deft ability at, I, at helping you see the individuals and, and their individual struggles and how they're so different. As I mentioned, this is highly, highly stylized. And many times Elizabeth and I were talking about how we, uh, we didn't catch everything uh, by, any, by any stretch of the imagination. And sometimes that's incredibly frustrating. I do, I like a challenging book and I like a book that uh, encourages me to come back and I'm teased with something and I, can, and I feel like, it's almost like there's something in the sand that I can see that makes me want to dig a little bit more. Uh, but this was so filled with other il uh, illusions and symbols and all of that that I knew I was missing something and it just felt a little overwhelming at some times. And for that, I have to say that I, I'll, I like this more, you know, Mrs. Dalloway, number one, for me, absolutely number one. I like this more than I expected to. And uh, it's definitely has given me a lot to think about, but I didn't enjoy the, the reading experience. I found it incomprehensible in some, some places. I can see how this would be richer upon reread. I think there's a specific person that this is made for. And I think it is a very literate, uh, very well-educated British person uh, who who is going to be able to pick up a lot of these illusions, a uh, lot of the references uh, that I just don't have. And, and I read a lot of British writing, uh, you know, a lot of British writing. And so it is, it, it is, I think, I'm wondering how this is going to age as we get even further away from a lot of these references uh, being part of, of just everyday life for most people. And I think this is actually especially true because my edition was the Oxford edition and they talked a lot about the fall of, of imperialism. And then we have Elizabeth who read a different edition that Janet Winterson, Winterson wrote and she talked and, and their perspective of what this was about was completely, completely different, much more about the individual. Uh, and so you you already see these these kind of warring points of view as to what this book is about and what it's trying to do. Is that e even going to grow in in time? So that'll be curious to see. Um, so yeah, I admired it more than I enjoyed it, but very glad I read it. And I'm more more glad that I read and saw her trying this in many different uh, guises. So from even from The Voyage Out, her very first book, uh, which I liked very much. I really liked The Voyage Out. Uh, you, you got to see kind of this jumping from point of view to point of view to point of view uh, in the sense of like a party or a dinner party or a conversation. Uh, and then we get to see how she, she hones that. Uh, and that was really exciting to watch. So, yeah. And then uh, I was so delighted that a few of you joined me in my annual reread of Helene Homp's 84 Charing Cross Road. I have my third printing edition here that was gifted to me. And I always have to show this because I love it so much. And it was signed 
by Helene Hoff. I'm not sure if you can see that. It says, greetings to a book lover. Uh, isn't that del absolutely delightful? Uh, I read it in French and it was humbling. <laughs> you know, I've been doing, I would say a year and a half of every single day French study. Uh, and I, yes, I was able to read more than I could in my cur very cursory review of it last year, uh, but not enough to be f to, to where I felt like I really could just read it. Uh, it was a struggle. Uh, it, it took a lot longer than I expected, uh, but it makes me very happy that I am taking the step this year of actually hiring a private tutor and going to formalize my study of French. Let me tell you a little bit why this is so important to me, because I don't think I do that enough. Uh, this is uh, not a novel, it's actually nonfiction. It's an epistolary story of the letters between a woman in the late 40s, yeah, 49 it starts off, uh, to a bookstore on 84 Charing Cross Road, Marks & Co. bookstore. She had seen an advertisement that they had certain editions that they could find for people, and she sends them a letter and thereby starts a correspondence with the people that work at this shop, specifically Frank Dorr, who is the main person responsible for her account. Uh, and you get a sense that it's a very small bookstore. There is only a few people that work there, and they, but they very much know their books. Uh, she is an autodidact. She's been teaching herself and she's a writer. She writes screenplays and for stage and uh, and also for television. And she's in New York City and she's very New Yorker. She's very New Yorker and they are very uh, British and proper. And so you have that that culture clash between the t between these letters back and forth. But there is a, a playfulness. Uh, and there is so much kindness uh, uh, that are going back and forth between uh, these letters. <clears throat> it also gives us a, a look at life after the war in the United States versus versus London. And when one of the things that always stands out to me is the thriftiness uh, and how people had to wait for things. And we just don't have that culture anymore. We have an instant gratification culture with Amazon Prime and, you know, get, get things immediately and waiting for something and the anticipation and the, the generosity that comes from a gift that is well chosen, uh, that is thoughtful and unexpected uh, is, is everything. Um, and that we see that as it goes uh, as we go back and forth with these letters, uh, we see kindness, um, curiosity about each other, uh, an interest in each other, uh, and but also the love of books. Everything is connected by love of books. So it's about community. It's about kindness. It's about um, surviving. It's also about uh, choices made and choices not made and putting things off and uh, and economic difficulties, uh, all of that, all of that and so much more. So if you have not read it, uh, please consider joining us on New Year's Day. I read it every New Year's Day and I do so because it just ha contains so much life and so many things that matter to me. Um, and it serves as a fantastic reminder in so many different ways for me every single year. And uh, knowing that this could very easily be lost in the backlog uh, in someone's library, uh, it's not sexy and glamorous, um, but I want people to remember it and I want people to read it. And so uh, the joy I get when someone has picked it up for the first time is, it makes my heart explode because I just, can't imagine a book lover not loving this book or at least getting a lot of enjoyment out of it. So with that, uh, that is what I read. Let's talk about what I'm currently reading. Uh, I am in, 
absolutely in love with this. This is Still Life by Sarah Winman. I'm about halfway through, and this is set in Florence uh, during and right after World War II. We have a fantastic cast of characters, kind of like a found family, which is another one of my favorite, uh, favorite tropes. Uh, and uh, some wild, wild shenanigans. It's a little looser and, and funnier and and uh, more exuberant than her last book I read, The Tin Man. Uh, but there's a lot of heart here, which I really like. And I, I'm enjoying these characters and her writing about Florence is giving me oh, all of those vi all of those travel vibes. I'm driving my husband crazy because I'll read about a, a street or a, a site and, and I stop and I have to read it to him because it's, it makes me so happy because I can visualize it. I know these places. Uh, and I, that's one of the joys I get from reading about uh, places that I love. So enjoying this tremendously. You know, I really did want to finish this and I did not. Uh, this is volume four, Sodom and Gomorrah in Search of Lost Time. Uh, I keep saying I need to prioritize this, and I do. I need to prioritize this um, no further than I, than I was before, but maybe I need to slow down a little bit and just put this as a priority as opposed, and I know I've said that before. You've heard me say that before. Yeah, maybe that's what I should do. But right now I have uh, some commitments, uh, and you'll get to that in a second. I've talked about this before where uh, sometimes I'll start an audiobook and then there's just something that I'm just not jiving with the audiobook but I n I think the material is strong enough. So I started the audiobook book of Burnt Coat. And I actually have it here. So I'm going to stop the audio version and I'm picking it up in print copy. And that's because there were some sex scenes that just Ugh, listening to someone say it versus reading it yourself is just a completely different experience. <laughs> and I just, it, I, I don't know if it was the narration, if it was the words, or but it just was not jiving. And so uh, I picked this up and so we'll be, we'll be adding this in uh, to the mix. And then voila, it's already January. Can't even believe it. Um, so to that end, I've got a couple of books that I'm gonna that I'm gonna be reading this week. Uh, the first is continuing to my buddy read with Elizabeth of Bookish North, and this is The Years by Virginia Woolf. So we're gonna move straight into this one. And uh, we've broken it into four sections. Uh, so it's gonna take us a little while to get through this one. But we are hoping to get that done by uh, Valentine's Day. And then uh, Leo of A Little Book Life and I are going to read Hana Yanagahara's first book. Neither of us have read this, even though his, his channel is called A Little Book Life after A Little Life, uh, which he and I both love. I have to say that I think reading A Little Life changed me uh, not just as a reader, but as a person. Like I think differently about suffering about the nature uh, and and true potential of relationships um, and all because of that book. So uh, we are very much looking forward to reading To Paradise, which comes out uh, in a couple weeks. But we haven't read, neither he nor I have read the first one, which we both have. So this is The People in the Trees by Hanya Yanagahara. We'll read this and then we're gonna be buddy reading To Paradise as soon as it comes out. So, as you can see, as always, I'm drowning in books and quite delighted to, uh, to be so. So that's it for me for now. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, I thank you for your time. I want to wish you a happy 2022 and uh, look forward to talking to you again soon. Bye.